Well, good morning, warm welcome to our worship for this Sunday. An encouragement from the scriptures from Philippians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So as we come to God this morning, perhaps with things on our mind, we know and are encouraged that we can bring all those things to our Heavenly Father. But it's that phrase, with thanksgiving, that's particularly appropriate today as we give thanks to God for the harvest. In the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 8, we read, as long as the earth endures, God promises, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Well, let's begin our service with the words of a lovely harvest hymn, number 732 in our hymn books. We plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land. Let's stand to see. Mm -hmm. around us um, the gifts you did see displayed on the windows and the front and so on uh, are just the tip of the iceberg there's a whole pile more of bits and pieces here which are contributions from the congregation and from the school uh, towards the Henley Food Bank which is what we'll be supporting today um, it's lovely to be able to do that and to do in doing so to give thanks to God for his blessings to us let's turn to prayer please do sit or kneel as we come before God and from our little orders of service printed on the sheets. We've come together as the family of God in our Father's presence 
to offer him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive his holy word, to bring before him the needs of the world, to ask his forgiveness of our sins, and to seek his grace, that through his son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to his service. You know, a special harvest confession, which has words of response. O oh God, our Father, we confess that we have often used your gifts carelessly and acted as though we were not grateful. Hear our prayer, and in your mercy, forgive us and help us. When we enjoy the fruits of the harvest, but forget they come from you, then Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. When we are full and satisfied, but ignore the struggles of the farmers, the cry of the hungry, and the plight of those in need, then Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. When we are thoughtless and do not treat with respect or care the wonderful world you have made, then, Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. When we store up goods for ourselves alone, as if there were no God in heaven, then, Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. Grant us thankful hearts and a loving concern for all people through Jesus Christ our Lord. Gracious God, we thank you for the gifts we see around us, for what they represent of people's thankfulness to you, for the reminder of how you provide for us week by week, day by day, uh, in ways we so often take for granted. We pray your blessing upon us and upon the school parents who've contributed towards these gifts, and upon the use to which these gifts may be put within the work of the Henley Food Bank. And we pray for the work of Noma as it continues to seek to support and respond to the needs of so many in our community. Lord, in your mercy. Down to a, another great harvest hymn. Um, hymn number 106 in our hymn books. Come, you thankful people, come. Let's have
Please do take a seat as we come to our reading. And as I should have said at the beginning, I welcome those who are joining us online and those who are here today for the first time. It's lovely to welcome all to joining us. Andrew, do come and lead us in today's reading from the Scriptures. This morning's reading is uh, a psalm, Psalm 8. It's on page 546 in the Pew Bibles. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. It's lovely to see you. And um, if you're able to stay after the service, there is going to be a heart's lunch, which you're welcome to join us, whether you've signed up for it or not. I'm sure there's a bit extra with it. Nice, but please do, if you're able to do that, and join us. I think one or two others are going to join us, families and, uh, and uh, as well. So it would be lovely. Looking forward to that. Psalm 8, uh, page 546, if you want to follow in the church Bibles, there are lots at the back. Let's start heads some prayer. Loving God, we come in the spirit of thanksgiving this morning to reflect on how you give us all that we have. We pray that you'd inspire us from your word today and encourage us to know how much you love us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Some years ago, uh, Time magazine featured a story about um, uh, a well-known actor, uh, Peter Sellers, some of you may know him very well, those little older perhaps, uh, from the Goon Shows and Pink Panther films of, uh, of the day. Um, and the article was about him appearing on The Muppet Show and being interviewed by Kermit the Frog. And his interview began with Kermit telling Peter, now just relax and be yourself. And Peter Sellers responded, uh, can't be myself because I don't know who I am. The real me doesn't exist. Now, I suppose that Peter Sellers, being the comedian what he was, was trying to be funny. But on this occasion, his words came across as rather sad. One of his longtime friends later commented in the article, uh, poor Peter, the real Peter, disappeared a long time ago. Uh, what he is now is simply a mixture of all the stage and screen characters he's ever played. And now he's trying frantically to unsnarl that mess and find out who he really is. Now, I don't know if Peter Sellers was ever able to do that because just six months later he actually passed away. But whether he did or not, he wasn't alone in his confused feelings. Lots of people want to know, who am I? Where, where do I stand in this enormous universe where do i fit into this world where do i fit into even my own little part of it who am i and uh, i think since the covid crisis the sort of questions that people have been asking you know, what matters in my life what is the new normal going to be for me i've seen all sorts of different ways of living in this last couple of years uh, and what positive things might I draw from all of this? 
And, and at root, these questions mirror the questions people have asked for centuries. Who am I? Where I'm here? Why am I here? And what's the purpose of life anyway? And answers to these questions each have pointers in our psalm, which is, of course, a wonderful psalm of praise and thanksgiving to God as we come to this Sunday. Sunday. It's a psalm that reflects on how God has a relationship with this world and that provides for us so that we can say long thank yous to him. So I want you to begin by picturing King David, as he later became, young lad at the time, a bit like then, sitting on a hillside outside Bethlehem, looking after his father's sheep. And one night he's there and he's gazing up at the stars. And suddenly he has a heart filled with wonder at God's creation all around him. And rather like us today at this harvest service, he takes a moment. He has a sort of, just a stop and reflect moment out of his busy life and realizes there is a lot to be thankful for. And his thoughts turn to the God who made the world. So in his case, as he was a musician, he takes out his harp and he begins to sing, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now that's quite a thing. I used to be a great fan of Charlie Brown cartoons. Uh, and he had a, a dog called Snoopy, who was often pictured lying on top of his kennel. And one night, Snoopy was also stretched out looking up at the sky. And by contrast with a psalmist, he can only think of himself. He says, I can hear my heart beating. I can hear my stomach growling. I can hear my bones creaking. And he complains, my body is making so much noise, I can't sleep. And Charles Schultz, who wrote that, actually was a Christian, he, he, I think, was making the point that if we look just at ourselves, we might well struggle to make sense of this world. But at the beginning of the psalm, the psalmist looks in a very different direction. He, he gazes at that scarlet sky and he sees a lesson about God. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. See, his focus is not on himself, anyone, or whatever it might be, but it's on God. And it's that that inspires him to an expression of praise. It's why people down the centuries have begun meals with things like a few words of thanksgiving to God in the grace. I know it's tended to be dropped out in one society. People sit around televisions watching, uh, watching things as they eat. But it, it's a wonderful thing because it just focuses our thoughts for a moment. On the one who provides the food that we have. And in this case, the essence of who? his name symbolizes all that God stands for. And the point is David lying on his back, sheep bleating around him, thinks of the creator who made him and them and the world around. Now you might think that's a very simple point, but it is where the world at large and God's word sometimes diverge. Many people look around and only see natural objects, things, whereas God's word encourages us to look around and see evidence of God's hand at work. And for, for David, even as he stares at the sky, it's, it's a natural thing, both to wonder at the amazing creator who made everything, and to include a reflection on the place people might have as part of the creator's past. We're, we're really just beginning to discover some of the secrets of the universe with new um, uh, helicopters, I was going to say, <laughs> new, what do you call it? <laughs> What's the word? Telescopes, that's the word, but they're, they're, they're rather, they're not pointy things anymore, are they? They're uh, working all sorts of different uh, ways. But um, he looks at the, the, the sky and he sees the heavens and he talks about it as the work of God's fingers, as if even that is just a kind of God fiddling about, as it were. Um, the moon and the stars which you set in place, just kind of casually. And he has this enormous picture of God's extraordinary creative power and strength. But, but within that, notice how David speaks not only about the Lord, Lord, he says, 
But he also describes him as our Lord, verse one, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in the world. In other words, the psalmist has a thrill of pride as he recognizes that the God who made all this is our Lord, the Lord of his people. We've been as a church, both here and at Trinity at Four, looking at the first epistle to Peter. And we've seen that God is a God who delights in choosing people to be part of his family, to be uniquely his, and to have a special relationship with him. And that's the kind of relationship David has. Someone who treats him as a special child. Uh, that's my um, second point, really. Um, first of all, what an amazing creation the universe is. And then second, we too are special, created in the image of God. So in verse one, we see that ascription of praise, which might at first sight only appear to stress the glory of God's name, also stresses his closest relationship with us as his people. And, and what makes this all the more, all more remarkable is the contrast between the small uh, our Lord, the small hour, and the great all the earth. He, he sees the creation and there's us tiny, and there's a whole expanse of the universe as he lies on his back staring at the stone. You see, it's that God who made the lot is interested in focusing him on him there on that hillside in Israel. And that's the contrast that continues throughout the psalm. We may be tiny, but in God's eyes, we're very special. So he's filled with wonder. He's filled with wonder and all, both at the splendor of it all. I know people, you know, a marvel at the pictures that have come back from um, the Hubble and now this new telescope. Um, but, but beyond that, he sees the creator. Uh, Paul, in his uh, letter to the Romans, encouraged us to, to, to see that creation itself, the invisible things of God, are being perceived through the things that, he's, that are made even his everlasting power and Godhood. So sometimes people just stop at seeing stars and whatever, but he, Paul encourages to say, these are pointers to us of the person behind creation. And that's where verse two continues, isn't it? It's his reflection on God's hand at work in his creation. It actually says, through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Um, I think what he's kind of got in mind is, well, I was fortunate enough to meet my latest little grandchild this week, 11 weeks old, little um, Sienna. And my eyes, she's beautiful. I don't know whether she is in other people. But you know the sort of comments people make about babies. Oh, he's got more eyes. Or isn't she beautiful? And all these sort of things. People say that whatever a child looks like. So I don't think it would pinch his off. But the psalmist is making the point that there's something special about every single human being, just as we might make those comments about babies. Actually, however small or frail we may feel in the cosmos, every tiny one of us and every tiny baby is made in the image of God and reveals and reflects God to those who would see through the praise of children and infants, he says. And the fact that he chooses children to illustrate this point that we're special is probably because the psalmist is very well aware that if we were to talk about adults, well, we can display a very different and sinful nature just as easily as a godly one. Um, the same verse speaks about enemies of God, the foe and the avenger being in opposition to God. But he's focusing here on the positive and he uses the young to represent God's perfect creation. Now, I know children aren't perfect. Uh, and there's never been a child in this world who's had to be taught to be naughty or to be selfish. But for the purposes of this song, the young remind us of God's special love of human beings in creation. And what the psalmist is focusing on is the fact that they're created in the image. Not that we look like him as such, but that we're made for a relationship with him. We can make decisions like he can make decisions and we're responsible for our decisions and, and most importantly we can love in the same way that God loves us we can hate the things that God hates and we can at best 
be mirrors of God himself because God created us in his own image, created us to be objects of his love. So we need to recognize this fact that God created us, we're important to him. And therefore, when sometimes you get a bit low or feel a bit fed up or get lonely, here's an encouragement. Just think how special you still are to God. Uh, look, look at the end of the, this uh, psalm from verse 5 onwards. See how David marvels at the honour God has given to mankind in his creation. He says, you've made them a little lower than angels and crowned them with glory and honour. There's this sense of awe and wonder, not just at the vastness of God's universe, against which he seems small by comparison, but at the the honour that God gifts to just ordinary human beings. And what amazing gifts he gives us. What is mankind, verse 4, that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You've made them a little lower than angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet. There he is just looking after one small flock of sheep. But he says, actually, God's put us in this world to be in charge of so many creatures and animals. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swims the paths of the sea. He's, he's celebrating what is proclaimed in the first book of Genesis, the fact that God's given us a responsibility to love and to care for this world. So as we celebrate with thanksgiving the fruit of God's creation in our harvest service today, the psalmist reminds us of a very special role God has given human beings in holding a responsibility for all the magnificent gifts of his creation. And that's important. It's important to note and to underline because, to be honest, the other side of things is all too evident in our world too often, isn't it? That mankind is responsible also for so much damage. Uh, and, you know, it's not just news headlines and things out there, as it were. We know full well that in our own lives, we're, we're often far from deserving of the trust that God places in us. There are faults and failings uh, plenty. And that, again, is plain difficult teaching. Just after the creation in the book of Genesis, that first book, you remember how Adam and Eve did the very thing that God told them not to do? You're not to eat of the tree in the center of the garden. That's what they did. The devil tempted them and they yielded to Satan's temptation. And as we look around, not just at the world, but in our own lives, we're still suffering the consequences of that. We're created to walk with God. We're created to talk with him. We're created to have a fellowship with him, but we can't readily do so because of the great chasm of sin that lies between us. But don't be disheartened. Because the Bible message is also that Jesus makes us able once again to reflect God's image. You see, we might read this psalm just as it is in its Old Testament context and leave it there. But of course, it's also a psalm that's used in the New Testament. Uh, and it's in the New Testament, used to make plain that Jesus makes us once again able to reflect God's image. In other words, to be the kind of people God wants us to be. If we're left to ourselves, we would have no answer to the problem sin causes. We might look around us at creation and see less of the creation and more of the mess that human beings have made and are making of it. And we might be so focused on our sins that we end up totally defeated walk around with our heads down, feeling that we're worth nothing at all. So something, someone else is needed. And we need to grasp that we're created in the image of God and need someone to repair that image. Well, just as we began by thinking about Peter Seller saying, I don't know who I am, the real me doesn't exist. We need to rediscover the truth of how much God loves us and how through Jesus Christ we can be made full and complete again. So, as I said, the New Testament talks about this psalm. Colossians 2 verse 10 has the Apostle Paul writing this to Christians. He says, you are complete in him who is the head 
of all principality and power. And when he says you are complete in him, that word complete is, uh, it's a kind of word from naval terminology, from nautical terminology, if you like. And it could be translated, you are ready for the voyage of life in him. Isn't that a wonderful way of encouraging us? You are ready for the voyage of life in Christ. And whatever you need for the voyage, you'll find in him. And how can Christ make that difference? Well, the answer is that Jesus came as the truth fulfillment of this side. The psalm, as I say, is quoted three times in the New Testament. And each tells us something about how Jesus fulfills the promise of the psalm. So Hebrews 2 verse 5 says, We do not yet see everything in subjection to him, that is God. Then it immediately adds, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honour. And what the writer is saying, quoting this psalm, is that yes, man has sinned and fallen, and consequently lost some of his authority and the delight in God's creation. But in Jesus, his dominion has been restored. And the writer in the Hebrews goes on to say how Jesus, by his death, has destroyed the devil and delivered those who were kept captive by him. That's one reference. The second reference is in Ephesians chapter one, where Paul writes that the exceeding greatness of God's power, which exalted Jesus, and then he quotes the psalm, put all things under his feet, verse 22, is in consequence available to us who believe. Paul says that we've experienced it, where it has raised us from the death of sin and exalted us with Christ and made us sit with him in heavenly places. And he goes on, but because of his great love for us, God, who's rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. And even that's not the end. So there are third, three references. Although Christ is far exalted above all kingdom and power and all things, eventually under his feet, not all lands have yet admitted their feet surrendered to him. But the promises later on in the same uh, book, for he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Or verse 27 of Ephesians 2, he has put everything under his feet, it says, again quoting the psalm. So whether you followed all those references or not, the point is, Jesus comes to fulfill the great promise of the psalm and to restore you and I to this special place that God wants for us. So on this Harvest Sunday, don't just look at the gifts and say, it's wonderful we're able to help people in food banks. It is great. Don't just look at the universe and say, what an amazing place we live in. Look at the universe, look at the gifts around and say, what an incredible God we have. And what an incredible relationship he wants with you and me. And what an incredible thing he's done in sending Jesus to make that possible. Uh, let me end with an, another true story. Um, this year sees the 53rd anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission to land men on the moon. I know we're just about to start another process in Artemis, aren't we? And um, you, you remember the story, you know, that first step, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, that's uh, how they landed on the moon. On the way back, Three astronauts, as they hurtled back to, to Earth, uh, they participated in a, a televised broadcast. And the second man to land on the moon, the step on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, commented, there's been far more than three men on a mission to the moon, more still than the efforts of a government and industry team, more even than the efforts of one nation. We feel that this stands as a symbol of the insatiable curiosity of all mankind to explore the unknown. Uh, and then he went on, because he, he was um, a man of deep faith himself, but he said, personally, in reflecting on the events of the past several days, a verse from the Psalms comes to mind. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Now, 
most of us are probably a little too old to kind of think about being those next to step on the moon and experience the out of the world views of our universe some may not be uh, but we can certainly grasp the same truths that Buzz Aldrin and so many others have learned from God's world. This is, this psalm is a hymn of worship calling us to, in our thanksgivings, to worship the Creator. And it does so by inspiring us to, to see our own privileged status at the heart of creation, exceeding all other created things. But it also challenges us that this is possible only once we return to the right relationship with God, which is only possible through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Perhaps our thoughts need to be not just to the objects around us, or even to the sky at night, to have the joy of a clear night one night if it's turned out there, but to see what it says about the incredible love God has for you and I, tiny as we are. With our, within our universe and what he's done to win our salvation. Amen. We're going to sing once more. Um, it's hymn number 153 in our hymn book, Score the Fruits of His Creation. That's 153. We pray for the harvest. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We so want to thank you, Father God, for our late queen and the seeds that she sowed. Those words spoken twice at her funeral, heard by more than four billion people, like seeds scattered far and wide across the world. We pray, Holy Spirit, that those seeds fell on good ground, that they would take root and grow, that you would water and nourish them until they are ripe for harvest. We thank you too for the, her legacy of faith. We pray that King Charles stewards that legacy, that his relationship with you grows deep and strong, that he rises up in his role of defender of the faith, 
that he ensures that the church stays true to your word, Lord God, and its promises and its purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. We pray too for all those in authority, for Liz Truss and our government, particularly in these challenging times, that they too would steward the late Queen's legacy. We bless them with wisdom, that they would govern with understanding, compassion and righteousness, that they would recognize and implement God's plan and purposes for this nation. We pray, Jesus, in your name. Thank you, Lord. Your word says that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, that we should ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. We pray that you would help us to be those good workers in the fields of our communities. As you, Holy Spirit, water and grow the seeds, we pray that we would be sensitive, alert and wise to your nourishing growing process and pray and wait for your timing and not attempt to force the harvest before it is time. We pray too that we would also be sowers of good seeds, that we would sow our faith, that made in God's image, we would share what that means to us and the difference our relationship with Jesus brings to our lives. We pray that you would help us sow love and gladness, joy and delight, thanksgiving and gratitude, peace and rest, honor and righteousness, that as we sow, so shall we reap a kingdom harvest in this town. And finally, we thank you for our physical harvest, for your goodness in sending the sun and the rain upon our green and pleasant land, for the crops, the fruit and vegetables, the animals, the fowl, for the fish and shellfish from the lakes and seas, for the energy harvested from the wind and the sun, the natural gas beneath the waters. And we ask your blessing on the farmers that they steward the land well. We ask for wisdom for all those who oversee the farming community and the fruits of their labor, for the retailers who purchase, that farmers would be profitable and as a nation, we would become more self-sufficient even overflowing with harvest of abundance to share. We ask in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And to finish, we pray the word from Chronicles, that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. We ask in Jesus' name that you would bless this beautiful, amazing land. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. From our orders of service, let's uh, join in response in the prayers of thanksgiving that's uh, on the sheets. For the rich soil of the countryside, for the good seed, for the green corn springing out of the earth, we thank you, O oh God, for the warm sweetness of a fertile rain, for the hot days of ripening sun, and for the harvest. We thank you, O oh God, for the yield of the forests, the earth, and the sea. We thank you, O oh God, for all who work on the land. The mines or on the waters, and for their courage in days of difficulty and disappointment. We thank you, O oh God. Thanks for having me. For those who work in office, shop, factory, and transport to meet us. We thank you, O oh God. Thanks for having me. For these and all your blessings, we make our harvest thanksgiving and give you the glory. Glory is to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, and it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. We go in the words of the Lord's Prayer. How well will it be heaven? How will it be your name? Your kingdom come, and your will be done, and the earth will pass in you. Give us the day of our daily bread, and give us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us, 
Once more, let me uh, repeat the welcome uh, extended to people as you arrive today. It's lovely to see you folk here for our harvest celebration and uh, to welcome you if you'd like to stay on afterwards for a harvest lunch. In fact, this is a great day for food out if you want to, because this afternoon Trinity at Four are also having, holding a harvest uh, celebration and they have a harvest supper. So um, you can be fed all through the day if you choose to join us at our church services today. Um, but the, the hope isn't also that we think of others. And that's why our groups today and those of the Trinity Primary School will be um, going to the work of the Henry Food Bank, uh, administered by No Man in our town. Um, so if you'd like to support them, you may have brought a gift along, just add it to what's here. The school are going to have a service here on Tuesday and even more will be displayed around the church at that point, because we've got lots still sitting uh, in bags at the front here, we'll spread it around. Um, but also, uh, if you uh, have forgotten or, or, or would like to contribute in financial terms, uh, there are costs obviously in the food bank as well, particularly if you want to give family fresh produce. There is a little point at the back and you're welcome to add to that and a contribution to that work as well. And George will speak to the food bank. Um, if you're able to stay, um, we'll have coffee and things after the service. And then I think a few others are going to join us, people's families and, and so on. Um, so do hang around, mingle and chat and get to know others within the church. But see if you can find one person you haven't spoken to um, previously and uh, introduce yourself. It'd be lovely if you could do that. Thank you. Our last time it was not so unknown, I gather, from having sung it, but our final one certainly will be. It's number 200 in our uh, books. So it's kind of blend our voices. We sing, Brent is like faithfulness. Oh, God.
the close of our service, we turn back to those little leaflets once more and the uh, closing prayer that is there. Let's join together and say, Be with us, Lord, as we go out into the world. May the lips that have sung your praises always speak the truth. May the ears that have heard your word listen only to what is good. And may our lives, as part of our worship, be always pleasing in your sight. To the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The words of the psalm in mind, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love of us. We pray that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, would fill our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of Christ. May the blessing of God the Father, the Son, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest with us now and forever. Amen. Thank you.